college football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Monday, November 28th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. Hopefully everybody's having a good week after a a nice Thanksgiving holiday. We are getting ready for conference championships, etc. Let me go on and tell you first, before we dive into uh, what will be a little bit different show than what we've done throughout the season, we've been talking about games a lot, talking about ratings, etc., Uh, Today, we're just going to riff about what's going on in college football, just go through some of the news and notes, etc., about what is actually happening. Uh, But before we do that, I want to go ahead and tell you that the show is brought to you by BetUS. It is America's premier online sportsbook. You guys know this. You've listened to the show. You know what's happening. BetUS.com is the place to get signed up, and in the description below, you've got a link that will allow, uh, excuse me, allow you to sign up uh, and just get a $50 free play, no deposit required. So go and make sure that you take advantage of that. Uh, they've been around since 1994. they got fast payouts, incredible customer service, etc. I vouch for them because they are really good at what they do. So go ahead and check them out, BetUS.com. Also, I host the BetUS College Football Show. That's every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure that you jump in with us this week as we go through all of the conference championship games. We talk about the odds, the storylines, what's actually going to happen in the game, etc., or at least what we project to happen in the game, and uh, and what our best bets will be. So go ahead and check that out. There's a link in the description to make sure that you get subscribed to the YouTube channel over there as well. You can also find it at BetUSTV.com. All right, let's go ahead and dive into this. Let's talk about what's actually happening. Oh, uh, by the way, Go visit winningcureseverything.com. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, make sure that you do so. That would certainly help us out. Go ahead and hit that like button if you were watching the show, and uh, and that helps out quite a bit, quite a bit. We don't ask for a whole lot around here. Uh, We don't we don't do this. uh, We don't charge you guys for it or anything like that. Uh, What we do appreciate is likes, likes and subscriptions. So go ahead and hit subscribe and share it out with your friends if you would so kindly. If you enjoy what you are hearing now. Let's tackle topic number one here. Texas A&M has uh, let go of or has allowed to leave the offensive coordinator, Daryl Dickey. He has been with Jimbo Fisher since he uh, got to College Station. This is five years now that Daryl Dickey has been the OC, and this is not something that was completely unexpected, right? I believe that Fisher, after this season, realizes there had to be some kind of change made that he has to have some kind of uh, modern offensive system installed in College Station. And the way that you do that, which obviously you see nobody has come after Daryl Dickey, what goes on in Tuscaloosa, etc., happens at a lot of the really successful places. When you have a good year, your staff gets poached, you bring in new ideas, it gives you a chance to kind of refresh Uh, Come up with new things that allow you to be successful going forward because you have to adapt. Ironically, Dabo Sweeney talked about this back in 2015 before the team made their first CFP. He talked about the fact that you have to continue adapting and evolving. Uh, Otherwise, you will eventually start to decline. You can't stay the same forever because other teams will catch up to you and they will pass you. They will find ways. And Alabama did this, right? If, If you compare yourself to Alabama, which is what they do in College Station, then you have to be able to adapt as well. This Alabama offense looks nothing like what they looked like in 2015. It just doesn't. When Lane Kiffin was brought in in 2014, he was tasked with uh, redefining what the Alabama offensive system would be. At Texas A&M, it's the exact same thing. Now, do I believe that Jimbo Fisher is going to stop calling plays? No, I do not believe that whatsoever. Uh, But you can look at things like what LSU did in 2019. Steve, uh, Steve Inzminger was the offensive coordinator in 2016, when Ed Orgeron was the uh, interim uh, head coach, right? They brought in Joe Brady to be the quarterback's coach and the passing game coordinator. And Insminger was still the play caller, but he learned things from Joe Brady that he didn't really know that he could put into that offense before. Look at the way that they ran that offense in 2016 in Baton Rouge. A lot of runs with Darius Geis, etc. Uh, you didn't have a whole lot of a downfield passing threat. What you did have once you got to 2019 was eh, 
you know, a pretty good, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a pretty good uh, passing offense, you know, with Joe Burrow and whatnot. You had a lot of talent there that was not being utilized, and it's kind of the same thing at Texas A&M right now. You got a lot of talent, and you're not able to get them the easy yards, the easy plays. You can't scheme guys open. Everything has to be done to perfection, and that's just not the way uh, – that college offenses are run these days. You cannot come in with some super complicated scheme and expect the young players to be able to catch it right off the bat. And you're going to lose these guys. Some of these guys you will lose. They will not develop in your program. They are going to continue to move, and that will continue on with the transfer portal, etc. So this is a, a big, big deal for Jimbo Fisher. Now the question is, you know, a lot of people are bringing up names like Garrett Riley for offensive coordinator. He is, of course, at TCU right now, and he's uh, coaching under Sonny Dykes. Is somebody like Garrett Riley going to want to go somewhere where they can call the plays? Or are they going to want to go somewhere where they are just involved with the game planning and the practice reps and all that? Right? Kenny Dillingham, for a very, very long time, was just the game plan guy. He was the guy that implemented the offense. And once he got his shot at Oregon, remember, Oregon is the first time that Kenny Dillingham has gotten to call plays because he coached under Mike Norvell uh, at Memphis, and then he went to Auburn under Gus Malzahn, and then he went back to Norvell at Florida State, and then he went to Oregon and was actually the play caller out there on offense. Uh, Oregon's offense has been pretty good this year. Pretty good. Uh, maybe sands the second half of that Oregon State game, but regardless, <laughs> uh, what you're seeing here is, you know, uh, a chance for Jimbo Fisher to find somebody that can help him uh, understand modern offensive football. And I think that is a very, very good thing. I don't have a clue who it is that they would go after, but I, I do know what I think it is that they are trying to find, and that is somebody that will help teach uh, a new offensive scheme at Texas A&M. That's the biggest thing is help Jimbo Fisher relearn what it is that he is missing about modern college football and the ability to maybe steal yards, right? Find those hidden yards that you can take advantage of. Right? There are always going to be open spots on the field somewhere. you got to be able to get the ball out there, even if it's just an easy play. Right, You've got to be able to do that as opposed to, for example, the, uh, the last second play where they were on the two-yard line with a chance to beat Alabama in Tuscaloosa this year. And he runs, uh, he's got a, a freshman quarterback with a effectively a backup quarterback in Haynes King at that point that there's not a lot of chemistry but it's a route that had to be executed to perfection, right, over in the corner of the end zone. And it, he didn't even throw it to the end zone because of where the guy was running the route. And it's you, you can't expect perfect execution on every single play. So you got to find a way to be able to steal yards. I think Jimbo Fisher is going to be able to do that going forward, finding out how to run a modern college offense. So cheers to A&M for, uh, for making a move and – hopefully adapting in this new age of college football. Deion Sanders confirmed that he has been contacted and offered the Colorado job. Now, I do find this incredibly interesting because typically I think the rule is, and I believe Stephen Godfrey is the one that, that hyped this up the most, but nobody is offered the job until they accept it, right? So... It, Auburn has not offered the job to anybody yet, right? Wink, wink, etc. In this situation, like this is one of the reasons why Deion Sanders is not being brought up for some of these bigger jobs, right? His his name has been floated around at Auburn and even at Nebraska and a few other places, right? But Deion Sanders is one of those guys that's just going to tell it like it is. He's got nothing to hide. He's got his own team, his own way of doing things, and he does not give a rip what anybody thinks about it. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not trying to make Colorado look bad or anything like that. But Colorado probably did not want this out there until Dion actually accepts the job. We don't know if Dion's going to take the job, right? That's the biggest issue here. It would be a very interesting fit if Dion Sanders were to take the Colorado job. Uh, it's, I think, kind of a difficult place to recruit. Right now, I don't know that the money is really going to be there. Now, maybe he can stir up enough support from the boosters with his, you know, his fame and, and the hype that he would bring to that program. But Colorado is in a weird spot anyway. 
Like, I, I don't know how much excitement you can really generate in Boulder right now, considering you don't know what the state of the Pac-12 is going to be. Uh, the media rights still hasn't been done. Who knows how much money is actually available to that program right now, et cetera. Uh, transferring in and out appears to be kind of a, a difficult process at the moment. It's that's a that's not a great job right now, but it is a power five job, quote unquote power five, right? We'll see what he ends up doing with this, but it is a step up the ladder. And now Dion's name had been brought up for USF uh, along with a few other places. USF would probably make a little bit more sense, but Colorado, if he wants to come in and make a big splash immediately in a big conference, that would be a place to do it. And and you would certainly be granted. I, I say that he would see, uh, certainly be granted uh, all kinds of authority over what he wants to get done with that program. But it all kind of depends on what Colorado wants to do. If they're offering it to somebody like Deion Sanders, to me, that is signaling that you don't know what you're doing with your football program and you are willing to just hand it over. That's what it says to me. Now, I could be completely wrong on this. And if you're a Colorado fan watching this, I understand. Jump in the comments. Let me know whether or not I'm right or wrong. But it seems like you only hand it over to that guy if you are willing to wipe your hands of it and just do whatever he wants done. That, that's what it seems to me. Now, I, again, I could be wrong. But we'll, we'll see what Dion decides to do with that. But the fact that he actually came out and confirmed that he has been offered the job, it's very interesting. It's a weird tactic for sure. Nebraska. Let's talk about Matt Rule for a minute. Matt Rule is hiring. Now, he's already made a couple of hires, but he is hiring uh, South Carolina offensive coordinator Marcus Satterfield. Now, I'm sure some people are questioning, of course, if you don't know the inner workings of college football, uh, what's the tie there first? Well, the tie there is Satterfield was with him at Temple. Satterfield was with him at Baylor. Uh, Satterfield went with him to the Carolina Panthers and then came back to be Shane Beamer's first offensive coordinator at South Carolina. Satterfield was instrumental in making sure that uh, Spencer Rattler uh, succeeded in this offense. And they obviously did, especially towards the end of the season. They finally had things rolling. But the reason why Satterfield would leave to take the Nebraska job with Matt Rule isn't more money. It's not like South Carolina couldn't offer him more money than what Nebraska was going to offer. What you're running into is Satterfield does not forget that at one point this season, there were a lot of calls for South Carolina to make offensive coaching changes this offseason because of how poorly the offense had been running through this season. They've got a ton of weapons there, but they weren't doing anything. They scored zero offensive points against Florida just three weeks ago. Like and that's and that's right before they go to Tennessee or they go back home and face Tennessee and put up nine touchdowns in the ballgame. I mean, it's just absurd the way that things went. But Satterfield it, the last two games, if you take those two away, it's not like he was super successful as an offensive coordinator in Columbia. He just wasn't. But you add on those last two games against Clemson and against Tennessee, and all of a sudden Satterfield looks like an incredible hire, etc. Once you are on the hot seat, you are never really off the hot seat. And these offensive coordinators, they do not have these long-term deals, right? They might be making quite a bit of money now. I mean, Kendall Bryles, uh, I believe, is at $2 million to be an offensive coordinator at Arkansas. Uh, you're going to get paid a lot of money to be a coordinator, but you don't have the long-term security. You don't have a five-year, six-year contract as an OC or a DC because of the churn, because you might be taking a head coaching job, because you might get fired if the offense does really, really bad and the head coach has to save his own job. There's a lot of different things that are in play with coordinators, and that is the reason why Satterfield, even after things have certainly turned around, you know, one, I would assume that Spencer Rattler is gone after this season. I think he's probably going to go to the NFL. I don't believe he has any more eligibility, but I could be completely wrong on that. I, I have not looked into that to see exactly what they're going to do. But that is something to pay attention to going forward with all these coordinator hires, these coordinator changes, and that is... These guys don't have the security, and while it might look like a lateral move or even a, a step down when you've had a successful year, uh, you're going someplace that you get a fresh start and you get a little bit more security with a guy that you really, really know. It's not like he's not buddies with Shane Beamer, and it's not like Beamer was going to fire him, especially after what happened in the last two weeks. 
But at Satterfield, I think this is a smart move, and I think he can do good things at Nebraska with Matt Rule. It all depends on what Rule ends up doing. I mean, Rule said in his press conference today uh, that the biggest thing is you got to make sure you got your line play in order. Like, you can't win if you don't dominate at the line of scrimmage. Just bottom line. So we know what they're going to try and change there. We know what he's going to try and implement. And we'll see what Satterfield does. Uh, how, who do they get out of the portal? What do they end up doing as far as recruiting, et cetera? I'm, I'm curious to see what Nebraska looks like. But I think hiring Satterfield, who is an experienced coordinator, is a, a smart move. And it's a guy that he knows. So there's a lot of familiarity with the offensive system that Satterfield is going to bring in there. Uh, good all around on Nebraska. And, and maybe good for South Carolina to – uh, maybe make a change, even though things were going good over the last two weeks. Maybe maybe start something fresh for Shane Beamer. You've already got the culture in place. Bring in a guy that is capable of getting it done week in and week out. Uh, this could be a win for both sides. All right, on the other side, we're going to talk about the Rose Bowl delaying the college football playoff, etc., uh, and maybe some deadlines this week. We're going to talk about more firings from this week and uh, some dismissals, some transfer portal stuff, etc., on the other side. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right. Now, before we kick back into this, uh, let me go ahead and tell you first about Valtimeri Surf Company. These guys have an incredible college town clothing apparel line. Go and check them out, ValtimeriSurfCo.com. There's a link in the description. You can use the promo code GARY10 to get 10% off of your order. Uh, these guys are fantastic. The material is super comfortable. I own two of the shirts, the Tuscaloosa Surf Company shirts. I've got a crimson one and a white one. They are perfect fits. They, they're awesome. So go and check them out, Valtimeri Surf Company. Also, we're brought to you now by Flow Sports. That's right, the TV streaming company uh, that has over 25,000 different sporting matches over there. They've got rugby. They've got Division Three football, which, by the way, we are heading into the playoffs. They've got a ton of different things over there, including basketball, uh, MMA, etc. Go and check them out, Flow Sports TV. Uh, there's a link in the description for you to get signed up over there. There's a, a bunch of different deals and bonuses for the holiday season. Make sure you take advantage of it. Flow Sports. Go and check them out. All right. The Rose Bowl last week uh, had had given, basically, had tried to come up with a solution for the CFP to uh, expand while also making it nice for the Rose Bowl, right? Uh, the issue with CFP expansion, or at least early expansion right now, is that the Rose Bowl wants to maintain their January 1st date, year in and year out. And what they basically told the CFP is, we want, even in years where we are not a semifinal, we want an exclusive window on January 1st at the same time that we always started off, 5 p.m. Eastern time on January 1st. We want it, you know, a couple of hours after the Rose Bowl parade. And the CFP has told them, let's see, I'm, I'm looking at the article right now. It says, college football playoff executives plan to discuss further in the coming days the Rose Bowl's latest request as it relates to CFP expansion in what could be an ultimatum for or compromise with the sport's oldest active bowl game, sources tell Sports Illustrated. Now, this is, again, Ross Dellinger here. A final decision on the Rose Bowl's fate is expected this week. In its latest proposal to the CFP, the Rose Bowl is requesting to host a semifinal if the semifinals fall on New Year's Day, in two out of every three years, the semifinals are held on that date in an expanded playoff. 
It is another attempt to keep the Rose Bowl's traditional date and time, which, again, 5 p.m. Eastern time on January 1st, in future postseason formats. Alas, the granddaddy of them all is the biggest hurdle remaining to get the CFP to 12 teams for the 2024 season. If they cannot agree, the Rose Bowl would single-handedly delay expansion. And so they want guarantees, basically, the Rose Bowl does, around not only its role in future playoffs, um, in order to expand early, right? They they want all of this stuff in writing so that going forward, even though there's no deal past 2026 right now, um, or past the 2025 season, they want it in writing. They want guarantees that their slot, their exclusive slot, where no other game is going to be going on at that time, that they will be taken care of. And I don't think you can do that. Like, it, it basically, it, it says... Uh, they, so, five of the six bowls, Sugar, Orange, Fiesta, Peach, and Cotton, are in support of amending the contract to expand early. CFP officials need unanimous agreement from all six bowls in order to expand the playoff to 12 teams before the media rights contract with ESPN's, uh, ESPN ends after the 2025 playoff. Uh, it says, few, if any, guarantees can be made for the playoff beyond 2025 because no contract exists. Now, the issue is, again, the Rose Bowl wants to host uh, a non-CFP game on January 1st, in that exclusive window, even in years where they are not hosting in the CFP. How does this make any sense whatsoever? Like, the Rose Bowl wants all these different guarantees, and yet the CFP is not in a position to be able to guarantee anything because there is no contract. Now, what what we're really boiling down to is this week, we could find out that the Rose Bowl will not be included as part of the expanded college football playoff because the Rose Bowl might be willing to just walk away from the table if they don't get these guarantees. And if they don't, that means there's no expansion in 24 or 25. That means the CFP expansion to 12 will start in 2026, and it's all because of the Rose Bowl. So we'll we'll find it out this week. Um, it says, if Rose Bowl officials do not agree to terms, they would be costing college football in more ways than one, wrote Dellinger. An expanded CFP would generate a combined $450 million in additional revenue by uh, in 2024 and 2025, as well as a combined 16 additional playoff spots. Labeled stubborn by some and traditionalist by others, the Rose Bowl's position has long been expected, previously described by some as the biggest hang-up and the big issue to expansion. It, this is... This is insane. The Rose Bowl is absolutely a, it is the granddaddy of them all. It is a gigantic bowl game, right? It, it, it's the most watched bowl game because of that exclusive window every single year outside of the CFP, right? You have to be able to play ball with other people. I understand why they want that. We talked about it on last week's show, I believe on Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day it was. The reason. Why the Rose Bowl wants that spot is because of the TV dollars. That is the most... It, it doesn't matter if you put the Rose Bowl on in that slot or not. You could put the Citrus Bowl in that time slot and have it be an exclusive window, and it would be the most watched game of all the, se- of all the bowl season because of the fact that it is in that time slot. And yet the Rose Bowl... They want to play traditionalist. They want to do all this. Hey, even in years where we don't, we want to have a game on January 1st in that exclusive window, et cetera. It didn't matter to them when they were hosting BCS national title games. It didn't matter to them early on when you have to move the game off of TV for the NFL, right? When all of a sudden January 1st is on a Sunday and the Rose Bowl is going to argue. I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Like, you're a traditionalist until... You get more money to do something else, right? That's that's the situation here to me. Uh, but we'll see what ends up happening because I, if they can't find a way to coexist, if they can't find a way to make this work, uh, you're talking about costing college football about a billion dollars in additional revenue, or at least close to it, for two years of non-expansion. Like, do you think anybody in that room, in that CFP room, is going to care about whether or not the Rose Bowl gets an exclusive time window? No. They'll take a game. They'll create a game over at SoFi Stadium, the new billion-dollar stadium that's in Los Angeles. I mean, it's in the same town. 
I understand that the sight lines and the views and all that, oh, the, the sunset over the mountains and blah, 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 blah. Uh, the bottom line is this. If the Rose Bowl doesn't come come to play, then the CFP will do away with it. And that will just be another bowl game on another day, and we'll see what happens with it. But there are no guarantees past 2026. No guarantees at all. You could be looking at the third-place Big Ten team and the fourth-place Pac-12 team. We'll see what happens. All right, moving right along. Let's toss some music on this because we got some things that we've got to run through. Maybe turn that up just a touch. Okay, let's start with this. We got firings to discuss, by the way. (laughs) Western Michigan has fired Tim Lester as their head football coach. I find this very interesting because this year, we knew that Western Michigan was not going to be very good. I think they were like number 127 in returning production this year. They were an incredibly young team, and yet somehow they found a way to go 5-7. and seven. They were one win away from bowl eligibility again. Five years Tim Lester has been there and has not had a losing season until this year, and they go ahead and get rid of him. Which says to me that this was not about wins and losses, etc., because this was not a terrible year at Western Michigan at all. Uh, What it says to me is the expectations might have been a little bit too high or Lester didn't get along with administration, etc. Like, I I can see maybe where they might think that uh, this thing's going to go downhill, uh, but the expectations might have been set with P.J. Fleck years ago, right? When when he took that Western Michigan team to 13-0 and went to, I believe, the Cotton Bowl where they got beat by Wisconsin, um... I do find it funny that P.J. Fleck played against Wisconsin when he was at Western Michigan. They got beat in their New Year's Six game, and now he's beaten Wisconsin three out of the four years that he's been, uh, or three out of the last four when he's been at Minnesota. So, uh, But anyway, I, I don't, I think that there's something else to this with Tim Lester. I don't think that firing him is uh, going to all of a sudden net them some great candidate, uh, but we'll see. I mean, there's there's no telling who could end up uh, being up for this job. And maybe they do find somebody like a P.J. Fleck. I suppose we'll see. But it seemed a little weird to me that uh, that they're going to fire him as soon as he had his, uh, a losing season. Uh, I think that that team was starting to develop a little bit. We'll see what happens. So Western Michigan, I, uh, I'm not a fan of, of firing Tim Lester. I think he's a good football coach. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Next up. UNLV. UNLV fired Marcus Arroyo. UNLV also went 5-7 and seven this year. This is the first time. It, now, he's only been there for three years. His first year was the COVID season. They went uh, one win in the COVID year. They went 2-10 and 10 last year. And this year, oh, no, no, no. They may, have, they may have gone winless in the COVID year. I cannot remember. Regardless, either zero or one wins in 2020. 2-10 last year. And this year went to 5-7, and seven and had to deal with a slew of injuries. Uh, to Robbins, the running back, who had kind of become a stud early in the year. Uh, to Brumfeld, the quarterback, who had also kind of become a stud. Uh, they had the transfer wide receiver come in from Michigan State. Like, they were building good things there. I believe that the issue there is Marcus Arroyo. Uh, there's been changes in, uh, in leadership over there, and Arroyo, the guys that brought him in, are no longer there. That this bottom line, he doesn't have a whole lot of fans in that building, uh, from what I understand. It's not that he's a bad football coach. Like, he was surprisingly good this year, and there's still a chance that UNLV could make a bowl game because of their APR scores right now. Like, they're 5 and 7. There's not enough 6 and 6 teams. So, we'll see what ends up happening, whether or not they end up going to a bowl game or not. But a little bit surprising to me that Arroyo, who seemed to have this thing headed in the right direction, you knew when you hired him that it was going to be a rebuilding process, and and the project was not done yet. Like, it just at, at all. So, I liked Arroyo there. I thought he was doing good things. Uh, it's easy to make fun of him and his offenses at Oregon when they had Justin Herbert, and they they weren't exactly bombing anybody. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, like I, I liked UNLV this year. I thought they were heading to good things. They certainly had a leg up on the competition in the uh, in the Mountain West. But yeah, they go ahead and let him go after a five and seven year, which was uh, the most wins they've had there, I believe, since 2013, if I'm not mistaken. 
So it's been quite some time, uh, but this rebuilding project, not quite done yet, and they're just going to tear out the foundation and start over again. We'll see what happens with it, but yeah, I was not a fan of that one. Tulsa. Tulsa fires Philip Montgomery, and this one, you could see this one coming a mile away, right? Philip Montgomery is not a bad coach, and Tulsa is not an easy job. It, not in the new AAC, all that good stuff. Uh, Davis Brin was hurt multiple multiple games this year, uh, but the biggest loss that they had was they couldn't keep up with uh, the loss of Joe Gillespie. You, you had to have somebody come in at defense coordinator that was an absolute baller from the word go. And with Tulsa losing as much as they did to the transfer portal, et cetera, last year, that was going to be almost impossible. Like, that defense just was not ready. And I do find it amazing that they fire him as like immediately after a win at Houston who is, is still a pretty good team. I don't think Dana's in any trouble right now, but, I mean, we'll see. Like, yeah, one more year like this, and maybe. But it, it seems odd to me that Philip Montgomery would get fired this year. Uh, but the thing that was holding that thing together, because he, it, again, this is proof that once you're on the hot seat, you're never really off the hot seat. So as soon as he had a bad year, which I guess this is a bad year at 5-7 and seven because he didn't make a bowl game, but he just he set that expectation level so high, especially early in his uh, tenure there, where he won like ten ball games in a season. Uh, then he, I think he went nine and three the next year, whatever it was. And he did really really well early. Then he fell off, and that's when he kind of got on the hot seat. Came back in twenty twenty, wasn't expected to have a good year, and that defense was lights out. That defense was awesome in twenty twenty, and then again in twenty twenty one, pretty good defense. Uh, competed in the uh, in the AAC for the AAC title, etc. Especially like late down the season, um, he Montgomery did good things there, but I can't disagree that maybe it was a time for something fresh. Like you might have just needed a refresher there. Uh, how much money were the boosters willing to invest in a Philip Montgomery program at this point? Like you kind of know what you're getting with him, so how how easy is it to be excited? about what's coming in the future. You know what you're going to get at this point. So, uh, it might have been time for a refresher with uh, a new version of the AAC beginning next year. So, we'll we'll see what Tulsa ends up doing there. There's a lot of names associated with that. Mickey Joseph, of course, the interim coach at Nebraska. Um, the, uh, the head coach at Incarnate Word, the former head coach at Incarnate Word, uh, that's now the OC at Washington State, etc. So, there's a lot of names involved with the Tulsa job. We'll see who ends up taking it. Wyoming. Wyoming, uh, well, let's see. Wyoming dismissed running back Titus Swin from the team after their loss to Fresno State the other night uh, over a team rules violation. And this is, you might think I'm crazy, but this is one of the reasons why I believe that Craig Bowl is so loved by his players and why there are so many at the, the type of guy that wants to play for him is uh, a very uh, grounded, good kid, right? It's because nobody is above the team. Everybody can play. Everybody can compete. It, you saw how close they were to winning this division by beating Boise State with a backup quarterback. You had a defensive tackle out. You had, you had a slew of injuries, and it's just next man up. And they treat everybody the same. And it is, you go by these guidelines, and this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to act, etc. And I don't even know what it is that Titus Swin did. But I do know that he was the biggest playmaker on that team, and they just dismissed him. Like, and it, it's not going to get a whole lot of play nationally because not a whole lot of people are playing. Like, they're not paying attention to Wyoming Cowboys football unless there's a head coaching change. But it's kind of a big deal. Titus Wynn, you know, if he's dismissed from this team, it depends on what actually has happened. But I would imagine that he is going to be picked up by probably a Power 5 school. Remember, Xavier Valade uh, was the running back there that was just massive for Wyoming last season. And he transferred over to Arizona State and had a pretty good year. Like, I would imagine Swin might do the exact same thing. So we'll, we'll see what happens uh, with Titus Wynn and with Wyoming, etc. But... Something to pay attention to to see exactly what the reasons are why he was dismissed from the team. 
Uh, next on the board, and this will be the last thing that we talk about, transfer portal news. Of course, you knew uh, it, it, it's going to pop open at the beginning of December, so you're starting to hear a bunch of names. Guys that, now that the regular season is done, they are going to start looking around for new homes. Uh, the names that I've got so far, Cade McNamara, of course, Michigan quarterback from last season who led them to the playoff. Uh, he was replaced by J.J. McCarthy this year. He did have an injury. Looks like he might be headed to Iowa, which is very interesting. I don't know why you would want to go be a part of that offense unless you just really believe in your ability to turn that thing around. The offense did pick up a little bit of steam towards the end of the year, but hey, I, I'm just a little bit shocked. So, Cade McNamara, it looks like he might be headed to Iowa. We'll see on that one. Uh, Luke Altmeyer, uh, the backup quarterback at Ole Miss. He lost the job to Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart still has quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of eligibility left in Oxford. Uh, so, Altmeyer is going to be looking for a new home, somewhere he can get some playing time. I would imagine that might be G5 level. Uh, maybe something will surprise us. But either way, we will see. Uh, Paul Tyson, the quarterback at... Arizona State, of course, he was at Alabama before that. Uh, Paul Tyson is the great-grandson of Bear Bryant. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Paul Tyson. Uh, he's not exactly gotten a ton of playing time anywhere. Uh, Malik Hornsby, the backup quarterback at Arkansas. Uh, not a great passer of the football, but an absolute burner. So, we'll see what happens there. Uh, it's something interesting to pay attention to. Um, interesting. Well, okay, so uh, let's get through this, and then <laughs> we got something else we got to hit at the end. Um, we have got, uh, let's see, USF linebacker Antonio Greer. Uh, he was preseason all AAC. He's probably going to be at a P5 place. Uh, really good player. Only got to play in four games this year. Was dealing with injuries, etc., uh, Tulsa quarterback Davis Brin still has eligibility left. He is going to be playing elsewhere this coming season. I am surprised uh, at this. A little bit surprised at Davis Brin. I, I really didn't think he had any eligibility left, but I guess the COVID year is what it is. Um, Jeff Sims, the quarterback at Georgia Tech. Now, he is injured right now, but he will be looking for a new place to play. Uh, he has not exactly developed the way that a lot of people assumed he would uh, when he came in as a freshman during that COVID season, he his immediate start out of the gate, they beat Florida State. And Georgia Tech has not exactly done a whole lot since. So, uh, here we go. All right, now this. We got to hit on this. I, I got I to gotta write my time now. Okay. Not going to spend long on it because it's, it's just now happening. Auburn... I, <laughs> Okay, here's the source uh, from Sports Illustrated. Uh, Hugh Freeze is back in the SEC. It looks like Auburn is going to hire Hugh Freeze as their head football coach. Uh, Ross Dellinger is reporting it along with a ton of other sources here. But, yeah, Auburn's winding search for head coach ended with the hiring of uh, Hugh Freeze on Monday. Uh, the Liberty coach, who, uh, while holding an impressive on-field record, was fired in 2017 at Ole Miss amid NCAA and personal scandal, a source told Sports Illustrated. Uh, this is very interesting. I I did not believe that this was going to happen because John Cohen, as the AD, was on the other side of that Ole Miss-Mississippi State rivalry. Remember, Cohen was at Mississippi State while Freeze was at Ole Miss. That rivalry was putrid. It was Festering. It was disgusting. It was pure, unbridled hatred with zero respect. Cohen was at Mississippi State when they were digging up NCAA dirt on Hugh Freeze. And now he's hiring him to be the head coach. What this tells me is that Cohen did not make this hire. Cohen does not have, he is not running his own ship in that athletic department. And you can tell it already. There is nothing that has changed at Auburn. At all. I mean, it's so, so strange. Uh, but either way, here's here's what went on. It said, Auburn's courtship of Freeze, while weeks old, narrowed over the past few days. The program targeted Ole Miss coach Lane Kiffin before shifting to Freeze on Friday. Cohen interviewed several candidates and vetted more than 20 before whittling the list to a pair of coaches long thought to be Auburn's top choices. 
Freeze's contract details are unclear. Auburn is expected to owe Liberty about $3 million in buyout money for hiring the coach. This is... Boy, this is something. This is something. I'm curious what you guys think. Jump in the comments. Oh, while you're here, go ahead and like the video for me, if you would so kindly. But, uh, yeah. I'm... I c consider me shocked. Absolutely shocked with what is going on. Um... Uh, <laughs> it says the marriage with Auburn makes plenty of sense. One of Freeze's daughters, Jordan, attended Auburn and still lives there. Freeze and his wife, Jill, have long discussed eventually building a retirement home on a lake near Auburn. I Did anybody want this job? Was there nobody else that they could hire? I'm just... I am flabbergasted. I think that's a good word. I think that's a good word for it. Like, maybe you ran out of options. I had been hearing all kind of names. At this point, I can go on to tell you, I had, I had been hearing Dave Aranda, uh, but it, that Dave Aranda stuff might have actually been Jeff Grimes. Like, I, I had heard a lot of different names. Never would have imagined that it was Hugh Freeze after John Cohen. Like, never would have imagined that. But it does tell me that this was a booster hire. I mean, just dead center. Um, there's no other way to describe it. There's no other way to explain it. I mean, this is... And, and what's going to be funny is seeing John Cohen get up there and smile and shake this man's hand and all that. And again, let me, let me emphasize. I don't have a problem with Hugh Freeze. I think he's a fantastic football coach. I think he's a great football coach. The issue is all of the background stuff, everything that's happened at Liberty with him reaching out to the sexual assault victim, uh, everything that happened at Ole Miss, etc. The SEC had moved past Hugh Freeze. And now, here we are. Because he beat Nick Saban twice, obviously he's got to be on the list. Just unreal. Just unreal. All right. We'll see what happens. All right. Let's go on and get out of here. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap this thing up. Uh, let me go on and turn the music down. I'll go on and again tell you that the show is brought to you by BetUS. It is America's premier online sports book. They are an incredible sports book. Just absolutely fantastic. It's America's favorite sports book since 1994. They've been doing it a very long time. If you sign up using the link that's in the description below, you can get a $50 free play without even having to make a deposit. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. So go and take advantage of that. Go over to BetUS.com. we got Championship Saturday coming up this week. Go ahead and take advantage of that. Get in some plays on the games this week. Make sure and tune in to the BetUS College Football Show. Again, we're doing it Tuesdays and Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to go through every single conference championship game, give you our picks on the game, etc., uh, our leans and whatnot for those that we don't think are best bets. But we're, we're going to let you know what we think about these games. Along with that, uh, Flow Sports, check them out. There's a link in the description below, along with Valtimary Surf Company, so go and check them out. Make sure that you enter in to the picks contest. Well, i gotta, I got to figure out if we're actually doing a picks contest. How about this? Stay tuned over at winningcureseverything.com. Easiest way to do that. If you've not already, make sure that you are subscribed to this show. That would certainly, certainly help me out. And click that like button. Go ahead and share it out with your friends. Tell your buddies about it, etc. What a day. What a day it is. What a week it's going to be. I'm excited. I am rejuvenated. Hopefully you guys are as well. So let's go on and get out of here. You guys take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, 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 all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.